All right, here we go with our next section on chapter five, part eight. Uh, we're looking at classical China and India. And now we look at the Silk Road once again. And there's a lot of exchanges, cultural and biological, that spread across the Silk Road that aren't necessarily, you know, silk and cotton and spices. Uh, so Silk Road, here we see it. We see the spread of religion, for example, on the Silk Road. So Christianity up here in the Mediterranean, right? It starts spreading on the Silk Road into Central Asia. It also spreads into Europe and into uh, North Africa. Uh, Buddhism spreads from central, from India into Central Asia, into China, Japan, Southeast Asia. But we also see the spread of Hinduism. It also spreads into Southeast Asia as well. All right, so let's talk about the first two, Hinduism and Buddhism. Uh, so merchants are responsible for the, or partly responsible, mainly responsible, I should say, uh, for the spread of religion, right, across these trade networks. Uh, so these merchants, you know, when they would travel, they would stay in, you know, in, in rest stops and they would donate money to the local uh, religious rulers, religious authorities, to the monasteries, right? They will help fund building of or constructing of monasteries or houses of worship and temples, right? Because if I'm a Hindu merchant and I have to go live in Southeast Asia for, you know, four months out of the year because of the monsoon winds, and I need to pray to my Hindu gods, then I'm going to help build a Hindu temple so I can, you know, do my thing. Or if I'm Buddhist and I want to go to a Buddhist temple, I'm going to help build it. So as these merchants are slowly making their way across, you know, the trade networks, they're going to build temples and monasteries and and uh, little by little, more and more people are going to be adopting these new religions that are being introduced uh, through the trade networks and through the you know movement and the spending of money of merchants. Now, one thing to point out is that the Chinese philosophies, they do not spread. Confucianism, Taoism, and uh, legalism, those are Chinese only. And it makes sense because, remember, those philosophies were all designed to try to explain and understand and fix Chinese society during the warring states period. So those ideas, they don't, they can't really apply anywhere else because they're meant for only China. So the Chinese philosophies don't spread, right? Buddhism, Hinduism, those do spread, right? Buddhism spreads, like I already mentioned, um, by merchants, but also missionaries. Remember Ashoka, sends a whole bunch of people, he pays them money, he says, here's money, use this money to travel across the ocean, travel across the desert, travel across the mountains, and spread the faith to, to other people about Buddhism, right? And these monks, that's, these missionaries, that's what they do, that's their job, right? And all they do is, you know, spread the faith and pray and meditate, uh, and just like Christian monks would have done the same exact thing, focusing only on the faith and not on anything else. So here we see Buddhism eventually spreads to China, Central Asia, Southeast Asia, Japan. Same thing with Hinduism, right? Well, Hinduism is only here, Southeast Asia, right? It doesn't go any further than that, right? Hinduism does not spread outside of India with this exception. And again, it makes sense because Hinduism has these very strict uh, social standings of the caste system. Right. So, you know, if you're Hindu and you go to China, the Chinese are like, we don't care about the K system. We have our own social system. It's called Confucianism. So no, thank you. So a lot of society, a lot of these you know, places, they already have their own social structure. So Hinduism can't really come in and kind of like push those old social structures and say, here, follow the K system. It's just not going to happen. So India, uh, be, you know, remains a Hindu place. Uh, but other regions, you know, Southeast Asia, they adopt Hinduism as well, uh, but nowhere near as popular as a Buddhism would be. And one of the kind of main examples uh, or reasons why the, the, the Southeast Asian places, right? So you had all these like little kingdoms all over Southeast Asia, right? Why would they adopt Hinduism? Well, who are the rich people? Well, the Indians are rich, right? The Guptas, the Marayas, right? All the kingdoms that live in India, 
They're all wealthy from trade. They have all these great things. Well, if I'm a king over here in Burma or in Vietnam or in Thailand or in Malay, I'm going to want to be Hindu, right? Because I want to have the best relationship with the big guys, right? With the Indians. So uh, we see the kind of like expansion of Hinduism. And one of the main examples is the word Raja, which is the title uh, in the Sanskrit language, Sanskrit being the language of Hinduism. Um, and it means king. So these local kings in Southeast Asia, they don't call themselves king, they call themselves Rajas, right? To establish, hey, we're Hindu, just like the big guys of India are Hindu. Right, so they start calling themselves Raja, right? So we see this kind of like as evidence of the spread of Hinduism throughout Southeast Asia. Now, one thing we got to mention is that religions change all the time. Religions change all the time and they evolve and they adapt, right? So, for example, when Buddhism starts making its way into China, the Chinese are like, wait a minute, I like Buddhism and all. But what about Confucianism? What about Taoism? That's been our thing for a long time, right? So they start blending and mixing Chinese philosophies with Buddhist religion. Or when Buddhism goes into Central Asia, like places like Tibet or, or um, Mongolia, right? The traditional religious beliefs in those regions was about magic and mystical elements. Right, wearing uh, amulets and trinkets and rings, right? And when the Buddhist people get there and they're like, hey, here's Buddhism, right? The Tibetans, the Central Asian people, they're like, uh, is there magic involved? And the Buddhist people are like, yes, there's magic involved. So they mix those traditional beliefs with the Buddhist beliefs and kind of create their own new version of Buddhism. Buddhism uh, is not a polytheistic faith. It's not even a monotheistic faith because the Buddha isn't a god. He's just a dude, right, who figures stuff out. So Buddhism traditionally is a, they don't have gods, right? They only have this, you know, universal soul type of thing. Um, but when it goes into Southeast Asia, the people of Southeast Asia, they're always, they had always been polytheistic, right? So then the Buddhist people that go there, the missionaries that go to Southeast Asia, they're like, hey, here's Buddhism, it's awesome. And they're like, wait a minute, is the Buddha a god? Is he one of our gods? And then the Buddhist people are like, yes, Buddha's a god. So in Southeast Asia, Buddha is viewed as one of many gods. So we see this, again, changing of religions to adapt <coughs> to new societies, to new cultures, and so that we start seeing those regional variations of religion. So Buddhism practiced in China is not the same as Buddhism practiced in, you know, Vietnam or practice in Japan or practice in uh, Mongolia, right? They have local regional differences. Christianity would do the same thing, right? For example, in the Middle East, right, which is, of course, the birthplace of Christianity, there is going to be a group of Christians who call themselves Nestorian Christians because they follow this guy called Nestor. And the Nestorian Christians, they do not believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that Jesus is divine. All right? They believe that Jesus is a prophet, like a messenger from God, but not divine, not the Son of God. All right? So that for a long time, there was this group called Nestorian Christians who spread the faith of Christianity, their version of Christianity, all over the Silk Road into Central Asia, right? And there's even, like, records of Nestorian Christian churches in China from, like, you know, almost 2,000 years ago, right? So Christianity isn't hasn't always been the same religion that we see it nowadays. It has changed. It has evolved, just like Buddhism, just like Hinduism, just like everything else. All right. Uh, so here we see Chinese Buddhist monks, right? Uh, notice that they most of them have head shaved because it's kind of like a symbol. Uh, here's another map of the spread of Buddhism. Um, so there's different versions of Buddhism. Uh, needless to say, that you don't need to know any all of these. 
just understand that Buddhism has changed. Religions change over time and over different places. So these are Chinese monks. These are Tibetan monks. These are Japanese monks, but they're all Buddhist, right? And they follow different practices and traditions and beliefs, but they're all essentially Buddhist. Uh, here we see statues of Buddha, right? These are, these are statues in Afghanistan, right? So this is, you know, in Central Asia. And uh, they would build these giant Buddha statues in the mountainside, right? The, you know, carve holes and start digging them out uh, or start carving them out. Um, so Christianity also spreads, right? Like we mentioned. Uh, so Buddhism, Hinduism, right? That's in Asia, Southeast Asia, Central Asia, East Asia, South Asia. Uh, but Christianity is going to be mainly around the Mediterranean, right? So it starts here in Palestine or Judea, right? Uh, this is where Christianity is originally born, and over time it will spread right across the Mediterranean, across the Roman Empire. One reason is missionaries. Right? One of the ba major beliefs of the Christian faith is to spread the faith. So missionaries, you know, they go and travel faraway places to unknown places, unknown people, and say, "Hey, let me talk to you about God. Let me talk to you about Jesus." Right, trying to convert people to the religion. Right, so these missionaries, many of them eventually become monks and, you know, they live their own private lives and they focus on their faith uh, and they don't deal with the rest of society living in their, you know, monasteries. All right, so, for example, these, you know, this is uh, the famous uh, missionary, right? His name is St. Patrick. Yes, that St. Patrick from Ireland, right? And he traveled to Ireland super far away. Look, Ireland's all the way up here. Right, as the farthest extent of you know Christianity, uh, to spread the faith to the people of Ireland. Uh, there's people who are gonna go into Eastern Europe, into the Germanic places, into Scandinavia. Right, uh, these missionaries are gonna spread the faith. So, uh, and again, they're all Christians. They all believe pretty much the same thing. We have local variations, but they're still Christians. One of the more unique ones are Ethiopian Christians, right? So if you notice here in this map, right, Egypt, the region of Egypt is a big Christian territory, and Ethiopia is right below Egypt, right? And Christianity spreads there, right, through trade, through missionaries. It spreads there, uh, and it remains a stronghold. Even to this day, a large portion of the Ethiopian people are Christians, Right, they again they follow their own unique version, but they're still Christians. So besides all these religions spreading across trade networks, right, both land trade network or maritime trade network, um, we have diseases spreading. We mentioned this before, diseases spread through trade, right? And this completely messes up populations. Uh, so around anywhere between 25 to 33 percent of the people of China and the people of the Roman Empire die from disease. And this leads to a steep decline in population, leads to a lot of economic problems, and leads to a less trade, right? a drop in trade. Well, also, we see what we call self-sufficient economies, right? So, for example, the Chinese, right, so... During the you know Pax Sinica or Pax Romana, when they were trading the maximum amount, right, you will have hundreds of stores who all they do in China is produce silk, right, so that they can export and they can make profit and they could you know make a living off of it. But when people are dying left and right from disease and no one wants to travel because diseases are out there and you know people are going to die, then what's going to happen to all the stores? They're going to close down. What's going to happen to all those workers? Well. Now they got to feed themselves. So instead of making stuff to export or to sell to other places, you're going to make stuff that the people of China need, the people in your neighborhood, your town, your city, your village. Uh, and that's what we call self-sufficient. You make enough stuff for your own needs. You can't worry about what you know the customers in the Mediterranean want because you don't care about that because you care about you know finding food for your family. So they become self-sufficient. Uh, due to the disease. And we also know, of course, that uh, disease and economic decline leads to a lot of political problems 
which led to the fall of Rome, the fall of Han China uh, as well. All right, so that's it for this section. See you next time.